very, very surreal being back here. I haven't been back here for many years. I grew up in in this house. Uh, my parents still take up the same row that they have for the past 20 years. So today it was the second or the third one, I couldn't remember. You know, I'm so excited. Uh, Josh and Steph, they're our longest friends, best friends. You know, they're, they're, Judah's only missing one middle name. I've only been asking for nine months. And, uh, you know, it could have been, oh, I was happy with Charles in there somewhere. But that's fine, it just means you've got to have more kids, it's all the same. Still available. Still, what, what a heritage. Isn't that right? Or maybe even Moses or Colin right there, he could have, you know, that could have been amazing. It's crazy being here. I, I used to work at St John of God. I drove past that place. It is huge now. Taking up the whole block, it just keeps growing. Uh, I noticed uh, in Geelong everything closes early. The part of Melbourne that I live in is the number one growth corridor in Australia. 170 people move to our postcode a week. It is, it's just exploding uh, with, with population. I, I managed to meet uh, one of the senators in our area, his name's Craig Ondarchi, and he's a great man and he feeds me with all the stats. So our, our church is um, uh, re really growing. For those of you that might not uh, know me, I, I am Charles. I'm a campus pastor of a church that's about four and a half years old uh, in Melbourne. It actually has a heritage of about 30 years. Uh, but when I went there with my pastor, Nick Reski, uh, there was uh, 15 people, uh, including we brought four at the time. Uh, they were all over the age of um, 65. It was uh, an incredible group of people that believed uh, that, that God could do something and they kept the heartbeat alive. Um, of that church. There's been many miracles that have happened. Uh, the block of land that the uh, property, uh, that there was a small church there, we managed to subdivide that and we, we sold the, the portion that was left for about $5 million. We were able to build a brand new conference centre. Then across the road uh, where we built, there, there are these warehouses. So it's got our building, then it's our car park, and then there's this high, about six metre high uh, cement walls that has a large warehouse house that's um, uh, bigger than our building. Uh, we had a lady that I never met that was part of the life of that church in its very uh, heritage day and she passed away and left a large sum of money to the church that we were able to purchase the warehouse adjacent to our property. We just put doors in. There is a counselling centre there already. There is a food bank going in there. There is an op shop. We have the ability for our community to be able to feed, be able to clothe and be able to counsel our community for free. Praise God. So it's been an incredible time. Um, recently, um, our church has uh, changed the uh, dynamic of, of the way it's ran over the past uh, four years. We inherited last year uh, a, a church and then just recently another one. Uh, so I've been, um, uh, if you call it promoter, I've become the campus pastor over our church, which is, which is really exciting because uh, I've been there from, from when I was 15. Uh, we now have about 450 people in the congregation that come at least twice a month. And it's incredible to see what, what God is doing. Um, I, I feel so blessed, but the, the thing is, is that he's the same God in Geelong as he is in Africa, as he is in uh, Tassie. I know that there's a person here from Tassie, Louise. And, uh, you know, that's important to include Tassie, let's be real. Let's not forget about them. I see those hands, there's like one, we'll pray after. But, um, you know, God is the same God, no matter, no matter where he is. And um, I love your hashtag, Love Geelong. Uh, I think that's incredible because for me, uh, what that says to me is that this church's focus is actually outside of the four walls of this place because it's about loving people that don't know Jesus. And I, I think that that's what we need to be about. We need to be about engaging and loving community. One of the themes that has been thread through my life at the moment is we all know the scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. So it's upwards and outwards. It's upwards with his presence and then it's outward with his purpose. We have to take this presence of God. In Acts 1.8 it says that he's empowered us to go out to be his witnesses. You see, we've got to take his purpose to the community around us. I love that you guys still do the outpost things. 
you know, the, the outpost is, is one of the reasons I am in, in, in full-time ministry. Because when my pastor was speaking here, there was a person from the outpost that came and sat in this congregation. And I engaged him just to say hello. And in that moment of engaging that person, my pastor, God spoke to him and said, this is the young man that you need to come and you need to come alongside and mentor. Because of a person that was in the community had come in, it released God's purpose for my life. Do you know, it can do the same for you. You have to be looking and praying and seeking God for opportunities. I want to share today out of Luke chapter 8, if you guys want to turn in your Bibles there. I love Luke. Uh, Luke was a physician. I have a background uh, in nursing, so I'm always interested to see his emphasis on things. The other reason uh, I like the book of Luke is that Luke is, is a Gentile, he's a, he's a non-Jewish person, and he's actually writing the Gospel of Luke for a non-Jewish, a Gentile audience. It, it says there that he addresses to the, the great Theolopolis, that's a, an honorary title that they give to a Roman, uh, a Roman soldier. So he's writing to a non-Jewish person, which is me, about Jesus Christ, who I love. You know, there are many great themes that run through the book of Luke. It talks about God. It talks about the Holy Spirit, obviously, with Acts linked into that. It talks about <laughs> salvation. But most importantly for me, which I find exciting, it talks about salvation to outcasts and to Gentiles. Because we all know that, you know, we have inherited the kingdom of God through Christ as well. So in Luke chapter 8, Jesus' ministry, it's in full swing. He's up and he's running, he's ministering to people. And he says to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the, the, the Sea of Galilee. I, I want to go over there. And we know the story, which I'll read in a minute in Luke 8. We know that when they're on the lake, this storm comes out of nowhere. Now, as a person, I was always confused. If there is a storm, why get in the boat and go on the other side? But what I didn't know is that the, the geographical locations and, and, and the landscape around the Sea of Galilee is very interesting. It's surrounded by mountains. And, and, and some of these mountains at the peak are 2,000 feet above sea level. Right? So up there, it's very cold. The air is very dry. And then when you get to the sea line of the Sea of Galilee, it's actually 680 metres below sea level. The air is humid, it's hot, uh, it's moist. So when you've got cold, dry air and in the same area you've got humid, moist air, when they come together, it has a violent result. It, because of the changing atmospheres collided, storms come out of nowhere. Mm. Out of nowhere. It's true that storms come out of nowhere on that lake. I'm starting to learn that it's true in life. Storms can come out of nowhere. Give me a wave if you've ever seen a storm come out of nowhere in your life. And yeah, it's good. I'm speaking to normal people that are honest. <laughs> storms, they come out of nowhere. I think often it's like the disciples. You see, when, when you get the call of God, you set out. They hopped in the boat. They set out. They, they were going. They were honouring the call of God for their life. Then they settle in. It had to have been comfortable for a period of time for Jesus to fall asleep. And then you swamp. And then out of nowhere, stuff comes in. But here's the thing, is that I have learned to realise is that Jesus is in the boat with me. You know, Jesus had commanded them to go over to the other side. He said, come on, that's where we're going. We're going the other side. So even though they set out with the call of God, they settled in, and now they're being swamped, you have to always remember that Jesus is with you. I love the testimonies of that. A storm of life can come through sickness. But Jesus is in the boat with you. It can come through financial despair, but Jesus is in the boat with you. What about if you have that relationship that's broken down and you've tried and you've tried again to mend it and you've humbled yourself, you've said sorry, but yet they refuse to forgive you and it's hurting you and you're in pain and you're calling out to God, he's with you. <coughs> Jesus has the authority over any storm. Any storm, he can command it and it can be still. So let's read that. Let's turn to Luke chapter 8 and we'll read 
22 to 25 to start off with. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A swell came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped. And they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. And in fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the wind and the waters and they obey him. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'll speak this morning. Mm. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to those who need to hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. So they're in the boat and a storm comes. The reality of life is this. I have seen storms take people out. Storms are real. If you have a look, the the writer Luke here says that they were in great danger. Why were they in great danger? Because they were in a storm on water. They were in a storm. They were in great danger because the danger was real. But there's three things that I want to touch on before I really get to what I felt God speak to me about. And what I want to share with you is three things about being in the storm with Jesus is this. Is that in the storms, you recognize and learn of his authority. Because of his authority, you want to seek who he is, his identity. And on the other side of every storm is always God's will. So his authority, his identity, and his will for your life. You see, his authority. I still remember a storm of life that came out of nowhere for me. I was about 22 years old, or 21, I had just finished my nursing degree, and I was nursing a patient who had just had uh, a knee replacement and had lost a lot of blood. Now, because he had lost a lot of blood, his blood pressure uh, wasn't where it needed to be, and in my inexperience, I came in and I was super keen to help him, give him a shower, get him ready for breakfast, get him ready for the day. His family were coming in. I wanted to represent him as best I could. So I come storming in the room because when you're a graduate nurse, you spend the whole first year just running and trying to stay alive. And I run in there and I, I sit him up really quickly and I turn around and when I come back, he's white and he's unconscious. This is a storm of life. I didn't know what I had done. Since then I'd learned because he'd had a decreased blood volume, I sat him up, he'd had a drop in his blood pressure and he was unconscious because his blood pressure was too low. So I'm in this crisis, I'm looking at him. I, 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 I did a very experienced thing is I'd slap his face, but that did nothing. So after this I said, I've got nothing left, I'll ring the bell. So I rang the bell. And I was in a storm. It felt like forever. I felt I was panicking. I was stressed out. Then the whole atmosphere changed. When come bounding around the corner was the ICU doctor uh, in a smaller hospital. There's normally a medical team, but it was him who came running. And the team followed him. And within a minute, he'd assessed the situation. I'm still panicking because I don't even know if I was moving. I can't really remember what it is. I feel like the room was moving around me and I was like in the... You know, I've learned that if you're really nervous in a hospital, what you do is you grab a bag of fluid and you walk really fast and no one stops you. (laughs) You know, so I should have grabbed my bag of fluid and and, and got running. But out of nowhere, he assesses it, he puts this fluid up, which was to increase his his blood pressure, and, and it went down into this little giving set, which is like a chamber, so you could really rush the fluid into the patient. And in the midst of my despair, I hear him laughing, oh, squeezing this chamber is really giving my arm a good pump. And instantly, I realised that he was in control. He had the authority of the situation. There was no problem. He wasn't concerned. He had the faith that everything would be all right. He used that authority. Do you know what I thought? My instant thought was, wow, if anything ever happens to me, I hope that guy's working. Because he had the authority. You see, 
Jesus in the midst of that storm had the authority. They came to him in a panic. Jesus, we're going to drown. He stands up and he calms the storm. The difference between Jesus in our lives and the ICU doctor is he is right there with you every step of the way. But often we are overwhelmed with the greatness of the situation instead of realising the God of all authority is there with us. Where is your faith? I often go, oh, I need to pray about this. Because his authority is there and his authority will go before you. Jesus not only settled the atmosphere of the people on the boat, but the whole environment was settled because of his authority. But you see, often because of authority, you want to know who that person is. Often the questions you ask are a great indicator of what you're seeking. The disciples, they turn to each other and they go, who is this? You see, Christ through his authority was beginning to reveal his identity. They were beginning to realise who they were in the presence of. You know, I remember many years ago, I think Eva rolled her cup and was left upside down and a man out of nowhere came in and, and helped her get out and then he disappeared. I think he was a man on a motorbike. I was a younger guy. But because he had helped her in that situation, and all of a sudden Eva wanted to know who he was. Who was this man that had helped me? You see, these guys were in the boat with Jesus. They had seen his authority. They had witnessed and experienced his help. And now they were drawn to know more of him. Identity was being revealed. You know, in Psalms 107, 29, it says that he calmed the waves to a hush. He was revealing himself as God. <coughs> Jesus Christ, King of Kings, most powerful being, our Saviour, is in the boat with you. But on the other side of every storm, you begin to see God's will. God's will is always for people. Let, let's read on. So we'll read from verse 26. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake of Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes and lived in a house had not lived in a house, all lived in a house, but he had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot, and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into a solitary place. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let him go into them. He gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this to the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to see Jesus, they found the man had been, from whom the demons had gone out of, sitting at Jesus' feet and dressed in his right mind. And in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon possessed man had been cured. Then all the people, everybody say all, all. of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got in the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out of begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. 
So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. So let's, let's think about this situation. They've just got in a boat and they've gone through a storm. Now, I am a very, very poor swimmer. And I have been on a boat maybe three or four times in my life. But one of the times that I went in a boat was when I first started dating April. It was at a camp from this church. That's right, single people, it can happen here. Keep coming. <laughs> Are there any single people here? Give me a wave. Look how quick that hand went up. He's available. He's ready to go. He's with a woo! <laughs> so they've just been on a boat. I remember being on the boat with April and we were at a camp, it was like a speed boat and they were going around and, you know, hitting waves and going up and down and we had these life jackets on us. I was absolutely adamant that if I went out the boat, I would drown and die because it was like at this cliff place and I, I just remember being panicked by the whole ordeal. I held on real tight but trying to be cool, you know, because just started dating April and but I was petrified. But I remember the feeling... It's the same feeling if you get off like a really scary ride when you, when you first hit the ground and you're, oh, solid ground. Yes, I'm going to live. I didn't kiss the ground because I'm a bit of a germaphobe, but I would have if I wasn't. <laughs> what happened is they've just gone through a storm. They get off the boat and they're like, yes, yeah, safety. And they look up and there's a naked person running to them. I would have got straight back in the boat. I would have headed the other side. So there's this person there in the environment that shouldn't be there. But God's will. Yeah. God's will. You know, I just feel in my heart to say two things. Um, you know, the first thing that, that I, I want to, um, this isn't part of my sermon, but God can change any situation. I just I want you guys to, to get a hold of this. Do you know, it says that, that he had been naked for a really long period of time. And then it says when they saw him, he was clothed and he was in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. You see, any struggle that you've had for a long time, you've got to understand if you can bring it to the feet of Jesus, he has the authority to make a change in the blink of an eye. This man had been isolated and naked for a period of time, gets to the feet of Jesus and everything changed straight away. In fact, it reinforces to me even more about the authority of Jesus because it says there that he was under chain, hand and foot, and that he was under God. And even that couldn't control him, but yet in the authority of Christ, it's instant. At his word, that man was brought to his right mind. You see, God's will is for people. Charles, I might have you come back up. God's will is always for people. As I read that, I just became consumed with verse 37. It says, all people asked him to leave. Oh, he had gone through a storm for only one person. The whole storm, the rigmarole, one person was the fruit at that time. As I read that, I felt convicted deep in my spirit that would I go through the storm for one person? If I knew that God could do something for even one person on the other side of it, would I do it? You know, last week, sorry, two weeks ago, we, we had Hope Tour. We were in 20 schools. Wednesday and Thursday of, of tour was one of the craziest experiences of my life. We saw about 3,000 kids just in those two days. Uh, it was this incredible uh, experience. And, and, and I felt God bring this up in my spirit. Because I was praying and I was seeking God. And I said, God, I just pray that hundreds come. And hundreds come to know you. And God said to me, well, what if you go through all this pain and all this work and it's just for one? Would you still do it? Yeah. Well, I want to be like Jesus. 
And if we're going to love Geelong, you've got to go after the one. His kingdom grows one person at a time. And they asked him to leave. Jesus. Do they understand who they were asking to leave? It was Jesus. And yet, he had healed the menace of their society. I mean, we all know that a naked person living out in the tombs is not good for property prices. He's helped them. He's looked after them. He's healed this man. And they all, because of fear, ask him to leave. But Jesus went through it because he's interested in the one. Recently I watched this movie called Hacksaw Ridge. Read about a man named Desmond Doss. He was a conscientious objector to the war uh, because he didn't want to hold a gun. And he refused to hold a gun, but he wanted to to be enlisted and go because he wanted to be a medic so that he felt, if there's any opportunity that I can bring lives together as, as the world is tearing them apart, I want to do that. But you see, his battalion of about 100 men didn't want him to come because they felt you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if he won't hold a gun, he's going to compromise the rest of us. We don't want him to come. They made it incredibly hard for him to get through the training. But eventually he does. And they end up at this battle at a place called Hacksaw Ridge because there's this cliff face that is a 400 feet drop and and they climb up to it. And that's where there was all these Japanese gunners and, and, and it's all going down. It was the Battle of Okinawa. And what happens is his battalion go in and and they get met with gunfire and they're absolutely destroyed to the point where they have to retreat except for one. Desmond ran into the gunfire to find the wounded to be able to drag them to safety. Now what had happened is the battle had gone all through the night. It's now night time. He's had no sleep. He's had no water. But yet he's he's on the prowl to find one. And he'd find one and he'd pull it to the edge. He'd tie ropes around it and then he'd lower it to the ground. Now, he wasn't a big man. And it would have been painful for him. You see the blisters being formed on his hands and the fatigue. But yet he'd find one. He'd lower them down. He'd make sure they had a safety and then he'd go and find another one. He'd drag some. He'd carry some. He'd do what he'd need to do and then he'd lower them down. And he began to get more and more fatigued. And then I was inspired Because the statement that would lead his mouth, he was a believer, would be this, Lord, help me find one more. Just give me one One more. more. So he'd go and he'd find another one and he'd pull. He was credited for saving 75 people. Mm. With the spirit of, Lord, help me get one more. You know, there are people that are lost, that are broken, yeah. that are in a world of pain. Yep. Jesus went through the storm for the one, for the one. But that it blows my mind even more that at the end of this portion of story, that the person that is delivered says, let me come with you, Jesus. Let me come with you. I want to come with you. And Jesus could have used him. Can you imagine the power of that testimony? I was delivered. I was set free by this man. But Jesus says no. He says you need to stay. And you need to tell them what God has done for you. You see, he now had his testimony. And he's now was sent on mission. To go and influence his region. To tell them about God's love. All had just asked Jesus to leave. But Jesus said, I might have to leave, but you can stay and represent me. You know, what's really interesting is that in other scenarios like Matthew 15, Jesus is well met. It says that many came. 
says that he healed many. It says that they praised the God of Israel. Now the reason is that was because it was a Gentile area. In fact, it was the same area that that one man had been asked to stay in. Next time he came, many came. In fact, Jesus feeds 4,000. It went from one man staying and all asking him to leave to 4,000 coming to receive him, plus women and children. The power of one person being affected by Jesus Christ and being sent on mission to go and tell his story led to many receiving Jesus. One at a time. So I felt God impress on my heart to ask you this question this morning. Who are you loving? Who are you telling your story to? To love Geelong takes action. You all have a story of how God has met your need, has delivered you, has set you free. Now go and tell your region. Mm. One man, the next time Jesus, many were ready to receive him. Jesus is coming back and I want as many ready to receive him as possible. So why don't we close our eyes right now. The one, the one, the one. What I want to do this morning is that I want to pray that God will reveal a person to your heart and your mind right now. That you can share God's love with. And that you can boldly tell them about Jesus and invite them here. To truly love someone that is lost is to bring hope and grace to their life. And hope and grace aren't words. Hope and grace is a man. His name is Jesus. So right now, once you have found that person and the Holy Spirit has revealed who it is that you're to love, who it is that you're to invite. I just want to encourage you to stand. Everybody should know somebody. And then by standing, we're going to pray together that we're going to see this house transformed by people that are meeting God's love. So once you know that person, just stand and we'll wait. the rest of the band to come up. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we see these people that stand here, Lord, I pray that this house will be a house that is willing to go through storms for their city. Storms for the people you have placed in their lives, Lord, knowing that on the other side of the storm is your will is your redemption, is your love, is your strength. I just want to encourage you to raise your hands just down in front of you. So they're receiving from God. Right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will empower everybody here to be your witness. I pray, Lord, that you will empower every person here with wisdom for what situations need it, for strength for what situations need it, for boldness, Lord God, so that we can see your kingdom come. Your will be done. but I just feel that there are some people that have actually gone through storms of recent times in your life and that you haven't yet seen God's hand in it. Do you know what's awesome about storms is this? 
is that in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about that. We went through suffering and persecution, hard times, so that we learned to rely on God and not on ourselves. But you're in a storm right now. And you need God's help. You need to feel His peace and His love. If that's you, I'd love to pray with you this morning as we sing this song. I'm going to wait down the front. I'd love to pray with you, some of the elders of this church as well, to pray. You can make it through. On the other side is His purpose. On the other side is His strength. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing.